I'm Lisa Abramowitz. Welcome to Bloomberg Money Undercover, a show that provides valuable insights into alternative investments. We take you inside the world of private debt, equity, and real estate. Well, let's get straight to the burning issues in private markets. Losers becoming winners as U.S. shale and private equity sponsors take advantage of higher oil prices. Next, the American dream lives in New Jersey's new mega mall with stores filling up, defying retail's woes. And direct lending keeps luring cash. We speak, though, with loan veteran Peter Gleistein, who says this sector is poised to underperform. Well, let's dig into some of these burning issues. With me, Bloomberg's Crystal C, Kelsey Butler, and Allison McNeely. First up, the roster of startups looking to go public is growing with an increasing focus on food delivery-related service companies. I'm looking at one called Olo. What do we know about Olo? So Olo is a back-end software company that powers a lot of um, the apps you use when you order a cup of coffee. It's likely that it's powered by Olo softwares. Uh, they work also with food delivery companies such as Postmates, Uber Eats, and they're looking to go public in 2020. So software has always been has been a hotspot in the IPO market in the past 18 months, and this one is a combination of a very trendy topic, food and software. Honestly, the fact that people are ordering coffee online is kind of amazing to me. Uh, which investment firms stand to gain if, they, if this is a successful IPO? So uh, Union Square Hospitality's uh, Danny Mayer, he is on the board. And so as the Rain Group and uh, Tiger Global, they're also investors. So when we see this go public, we'll likely see them realizing some of their gains. I'm wondering whether more companies are starting to eye IPOs relative to what we saw last year based on some of the high equity valuations that we saw, despite uh, perhaps the underperformance of some tech uh, IPOs next year. So last, last time, year. like, you know, 28, 2019, in the beginning of the year, we already had a very good you know, insight into what's going to happen. We had the Uber, we had the Lyft, but now, you know, we're not as, we, we don't have that much visibility yet, but we do know that there is the Airbnb that's going to come. We do know that there's Olo, and then we reported that Topgolf, a leisure company, leisure slash food business company, is going to come to the market. So we will see a good stream of IPO coming, but maybe not as much of a, as a blockbuster as 2019. Yeah, Topgolf being a uh, putting and partying kind of company. Uh, let's turn now to the direct lending industry. Kelsey, uh, the latest entrant uh, to this is SoundPoint Capital Management, which rose its first fund committed to this strategy. Uh, what is this fund? What's the goal? How big is it? So the fund is $500 million, and the goal is really to invest in uh, companies that are going through some type of transition or turnaround, so they're not quite distressed, but maybe stressed or um, trying to grow, but don't want to dilute their equity. Is it surprising that it's a hedge fund raising a direct lending type of fund? No. So basically, as hedge funds have faced um, headwinds, you know, everyone is kind of streaming into private credit where they're still seeing a lot of opportunity, not only in the kind of more vanilla strategies, but in some of these more niche type of plays. So if hedge funds are getting in, private equity funds are getting in, direct lending specific funds are there, <laughs> how competitive is this space right now? So across the board, it's still very competitive, but certainly in some of these more niche strategies where we're not talking about growth companies, we're talking about companies that are maybe having a little bit of trouble or need a little bit of a boost as they transition, um, it's definitely less competitive and the returns are much higher. And the line between private equity and hedge fund seems to be getting narrower, right? Yeah, definitely. And especially when it comes to private credit. Everyone's going there, and uh, you know we'll see how it all shakes out in the end. When you talk about distressed companies, one area that a lot of people have focused on is the oil and gas sector, and it's been a pretty contentious area uh, within private credit and beyond. Blackstone is taking a bullish stance, at least with respect to one company. Allison, uh, joining us now, can you give us a sense of what this is? Yeah, so Blackstone really bucked the trend that we've seen in private equity away from oil and gas. They actually recently committed to uh, giving Vine Oil and Gas, one of their portfolio companies, a $280 million loan. They signed that agreement uh, at the end of last year, and it really kind of says that they still have uh, faith in this company and see an opportunity here as opposed to trying to get out of it. 
So I'm wondering whether uh, you have seen the same kind of boost or gotten any signals that the private credit side of oil and gas investments uh, has seen the same kind of gain that we've seen in the public credit markets tied to energy uh, in the wake of higher oil prices. That's certainly something that people will be watching for. I think at this point, it's still too early to say whether or not, you know, private credit will move meaningfully into oil and gas this year with the uh, rally in the oil price. But certainly we're already starting to see some public companies or some companies come to the public markets, excuse me, to refinance existing debt. So we may see more of that trend in private credit this year as well. I'm wondering whether the increase that we've seen in oil prices is a long term benefit to these companies or whether it's a short shorter term benefit given the fact uh, that it could be transient and that they all face a, a pretty narrow window of profitability. Mm -hmm. So it really just depends if the rally can last long enough for them to potentially lock in hedges um, for the oil price, which would essentially allow them to get a higher price for their oil even if this rally doesn't last. If they are able to do so, that would allow them to boost cash flow. They could potentially fund more capital expenditure. So that would be positive. But again, it's something we're still watching. It's a little early in the trend to know for sure. All right. Thank you so much, Allison, and to all of our reporters. That brings us to my next guest, Jeff Eaton, partner and head of global origination at Eaton Partners, which is a Stiefel company, uh, joining us from Houston, Texas. And I want to just first get a sense from you about how popular energy investments have been among direct lenders over the past few years. Yeah, hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Uh, I would say, pretty bluntly, not very popular. Um, <laughs> the sentiment towards oil and gas investing from a uh, our investor universe, which are the, the institutional investors in the world, is pretty bleak. It's been bleak for several years, and I would say when the stats come out regarding 2019, they're going to look they're going to look pretty bad. All right. Well, we just uh, was, we're hearing uh, from Allison McNeely about how Blackstone, for one, is doubling down on some oil and gas investments. I'm wondering whether you're hearing similar things from your institutional clients invested in the private markets saying, you know what, it seems more plausible, given the disruptions in the Middle East, that these companies have a chance. Well, I would agree with that. I would say I didn't mean to be so negative before. I mean, there are signs for optimism. We're seeing some smart investors uh, start to sniff around, if you will, the space. We host a breakfast every year with a number of LPs. And we're talking big state pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, university endowments, uh, where we went around the table this year and asked, um, how many of you, raise your hands, are going to be putting money to work in oil and gas this year? I would say about 80 percent raised their hands. That same survey a year ago, December of 18, maybe it was 20 percent. So there are signs for optimism. Um, it's encouraging when you see people like Blackstone recommitting to the space. Um, there's been some recent m &A activity that causes people to, to be more optimistic. So. I'm generally one who feels like when sentiment can't get any worse is typically when things start to get better. So I'm, I'm hoping that we see uh, more interest this year. All right. And I'm wondering on the flip side about renewable energy types of sources and companies, whether you have seen more uh, investing and interest on that, in, that, in that space. Without a doubt, we have. I get asked the question a lot, Jeff, do you think that the decrease in energy fundraising, oil and gas fundraising, I should say, is tied to this increased appetite for renewables, I would say there definitely is some of that. So without a doubt, there is a structural uh, change going on um, where more and more investors are allocating more money to renewables, allocating less, and in some cases, shutting down commitments to oil and gas completely. Um, that being said, I think the predominant driving factor is more just um, fatigue on the, on the behalf of energy investors in, in oil and gas. When you talk about renewables, I'm wondering what specifically you're talking about when you t when, with, the, with, with respect to private investments. Um, so, for instance, we raised a, a wind development fund um, last year. And in our CRM system, we typically put a number of expected dollars from these different investors that could potentially invest in a fund. Uh, for instance, in a couple of cases, we had 25 or $50 million for some of these LPs in this fund's case, those commitment levels were tripled and quadrupled. So a lot of that tells you that the allocations are moving that way. Where we've seen the more the most interest, to answer your question more directly, wind, solar, um, some renew other renewable sources of power, um, the services that those um, uh, producers of power require. So there's definitely increased appetite in that space. Just turning quickly to IPOs, I'm wondering whether you've seen any fallout in private markets tied to the very public uh, weak performance of last year's IPOs. 
Without a doubt. Uh, well, I should say we've yet to see the, uh, the impacts of that. I would say that there is more hesitancy. So the immediate reaction from our investor base is, wow, we got we to gotta look at this more closely. Are these valuations that we're getting on paper from our managers, do they really hold up? Um, because the exit market for some of these companies, especially the bigger ones, is the IPO market. And if those IPOs are underperforming, maybe the valuations on our venture and growth equity portfolio are higher than they really should be. That causes some consternation. And I'm sure a lot of these investors are looking at their books and maybe even discounting the valuations that they're getting from some of these managers. Jeff Eaton, thank you so much for spending the time. Jeff Eaton, partner and head of global originations at Eaton Partners, which is a default company. Energy is certainly seeing some pain, as we were just talking about. This week's power player uh, is co-founder of one of the largest leverage loan asset managers. Uh, and he says you can find pockets of weakness. We have kind of rolling recessions in different industry segments, but the economy overall is strong enough that, that you don't necessarily see it unless you're zeroing in on retail or energy or something like that. I'm Lisa Abramowitz. This is Bloomberg Money Undercover. Now time for Power Player, our look at some of the most notable names in private markets. Leveraged loans have been one of the most controversial asset classes with regulators issuing warnings about the debt while some investors double down. We sat down with Peter Gleistein, who has specialized in syndicated loans for decades, about where he's seeing opportunities. He recently partnered with buyout firm founder Thomas H. Lee to create HGL Credit Management, a new private credit manager that plans to use CLOs and other vehicles to invest in leveraged loans. Take a listen. As more companies are private and grow and provide the entrepreneurial zest that the economy needs, those companies are private and they're financed with private equity and private debt. Um, so. The long-term trend here, or the medium-term trend, is very positive for growth. Meanwhile, investors want safety. They want stable returns. By stable returns, I'm not talking about fluctuating price-driven returns, like is the price up today or is the price down today, but a cash return, a cash stream, like an old-fashioned savings account that once existed, a passbook savings account, or a so-called Ma Bell bond, a AAA bond issued by a, a you know once now non-existent telephone monopoly yeah well one challenge though that i hear from investors with clos is that they invest in broadly syndicated loans for the most part other than middle market uh, clos but for the most part yes that's what it refers to and that universe has not been expanding and last year actually you saw a little bit of contraction as an increasing amount went to the direct lending market that these that these markets aren't necessarily conflated in the same way how does that pose a challenge or an opportunity to you well two things um, the broadly syndicated loan market in recent years has been mainly driven by refinancing um, as opposed to uh, new borrowers new transactions new lbo's and as we know there's a it's just a titanic amount of unspent, raised but uncalled private equity capital. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the part of the economy that's growing is the private side and the entrepreneurial side. If you actually step back, we actually have another question would be like, are we going to have a recession? What would that look like and what would drive it? You're trying to get ahead of that but, one. But, we're, but we, have, we have kind of rolling recessions in different industry segments. But the economy overall is strong enough that, that you don't necessarily see it unless you're zeroing in on retail or energy or something like that. But back to your question about growth, um, we see that there's strong underpinnings for continued growth. And um, especially if private equity starts deploying their capital, the most efficient and effective way to do that with leverage is, of course, with broadly syndicated loans. Um, they're the, they're the safest form of private debt because these are the larger companies. Um, it's highly transparent and, and there's liquidity. Uh, direct lending is interesting. It's been growing. And of course, the, um, what we really mainly hear about it is, hey, banks have pulled back and we're replacing them. So it's in that sense, clearly, well, it's, it's not completely new. It's an untested as a, as a broad asset class. It's certainly changed. And you sound skeptical. Well, let me just say this. Um, everything needs to have an appropriate risk-adjusted return. There's certain, some investors can just tolerate more risk, and you can create products with a higher risk profile that are appropriate for them. Um, it, the question I have is, um, to me, 
private lending look, looks like their spreads are too tight. They appear to not either have a sufficient credit premium for lending to much smaller, riskier companies, or a premium for liquidity because these loans are illiquid. So you think that it could potentially underperform in the years to yes. come? Yes, I think there's just not enough, there's not enough risk-adjusted return, in my opinion. All right, so... But I don't want to just add quickly, Lisa, that um, um, it's not a case of one size fits all. You have to look at each borrower and loan case by case, one at a time. So we have to be careful with these broad generalizations, but I'll generalize to say as a, as a new asset class, um, it seems like it's just priced right on top of broadly syndicated loans, which to me seems inappropriate. That was my conversation with Peter Gleistein from AGL Credit Management. Now, you know, one criticism of loans has been that they are long-term investments that don't trade that easily relative to public uh, securities, but they are attracting investors who expect daily liquidity. Peter Gleistein weighed in on that, saying he doesn't think anyone should invest unless they expect to hold the debt to maturity. Well, coming up, the American Dream Mall is file, uh, filling up, bucking the trend of retail departures from brick and mortar stores. That's next. This is Bloomberg Money Undercover. Margarita Louise Dreyfus recently mortgaged her company to secure a $1 billion loan, putting up her rights as collateral. Joining us now from London is Jack Farchi. Uh, Jack, thank you so much for being with us. I want to start just, can you lay out why this woman is raising so much money in the first place, given how much money she already has? Well, all of her wealth, practically all of her wealth is tied up in the company itself, which is a private family company. Uh, so she doesn't have an awful lot of liquidity. Uh, and she has this, uh, this commitment that dates back to 2009 when her husband, Robert Louis Dreyfus, died that requires her to buy out other minority family shareholders when they, when they request her to. Uh, she had a commitment to buy them out that, that resulted in a deal for her to buy out uh, about 17% uh, that happened last January. And in order to do that, she needed to take out this just over a billion dollar loan uh, from Credit Suisse. All right, so I'm wondering whether this actually means she'll lose control of the company and there's a good chance that uh, the banks end up with a controlling interest in her company. I think at the moment that's probably an outside chance. Uh, the equity value, uh, at least on the books, uh, of Louis Dreyfus Holding, which is the entity which she holds her stake in, is about $4 billion at the moment. So a billion dollar loan collateralized with $4 billion worth of, uh, of company, she, she ought to be okay. Her real problem is that the company's profits uh, are falling or under pressure. The agricultural trading industry has been having a really tough time the last few years. So that's why she's ended up with this leverage. Uh, and that's where the pressure is coming from. And that's going to be the drama that plays out over the next few months and years. Is there a chance that Credit Suisse would want to own a controlling interest in the world's largest agricultural uh, trading uh, company? I just wonder what that would be in terms of a conflict, in terms of something they would desire. Well, I can only speculate on what Credit Suisse thinks, but I suspect you're right. I don't imagine that Credit Suisse would particularly want to own a massive agricultural uh, commodity trading house for all sorts of different reasons. Uh, so I don't imagine that the end game of this is we're going to see Credit Suisse taking over ownership and operations of a big uh, agricultural trading house. I think more likely, if the worst were to happen, and I stress that's probably you know, not, the, not, not, not the most likely scenario, but if, for whatever reason, Margarita Louis Dreyfus weren't able to either repay or refinance this loan uh, by its maturity, then I think probably more likely you'd see Credit Suisse um, either trying to find a buyer by itself or putting pressure on her to find a buyer or an investor, yeah. uh, something like that, uh, rather than seeing Credit Suisse uh, taking over <laughs> ownership of uh, one of the largest agricultural trading companies. Jack Farshi, thank you so much for joining us. Now to our real estate roundup. Uh, physical retail has been having problems recently with malls struggling under pressure dramatically, which is why it's interesting that the $5 billion American Dream Mall in New Jersey that took 17 years to build actually is 90% filled. Joining us now to talk about this is Jordan uh, Holman. Jordan, can you give us a sense of just how quickly uh, this mall has been able to fill its uh, spots, its stores? So like you mentioned, American Dream has been in the works for almost like two decades now. They started opening in October with the amusement parks, the ski rink, but what we haven't seen yet are the stores. So in a filing recently, American Dream said, actually 90% of our stores are 
filled and spoken for. And if you look at the um, contracts under negotiation, that's almost 100%. So all of the anchor stores, which are usually department stores, are spoken for, and then stores that are 20,000 square feet, the majority of them are also going to be filled when they start opening in March. How good is this for the larger mall universe? I mean, does this sort of speak to it, or is this an idiosyncratic story? So what we've seen over the past few years is that malls have been dying, essentially. Um, there's a Bloomberg uh, intelligence estimate that says half of the malls in the U.S. will go away at some point just because of store closures, people are, you know, migrating to e-commerce. What's interesting about American Dream is that it's not your typical mall. It has a huge amusement park in there, and they're really building up the attractions. So that's not your typical suburban mall. Can we even call this a mall? That's a really good question. So what you've been seeing in retail is everyone's trying to find an experience, a reason for people to come in other than just the merchandise that they're purchasing. So when you think about American Dream, it's really that on steroids. You're really focusing in on the experience. And so to some, to developers, for sure, like they would say this is the mall of the future. To uh, you know, normal people who just shop, we'd be like, that might be more of an amusement park that I'm now buying clothes at. All right, so buying a sweater and then using it on the Hill of Snow, which is right next to you exactly. in the mall. Have you been there yet? <laughs> Not yet. Um, so, but all the stores open in March, and so I'll probably take a look then. All right, uh, the American Dream Mall, uh, reviving dreams of perhaps the existence of malls. And speaking of big money, it is time for this week's big number, and it is. $18 trillion. That is the size of private asset classes tallied by analysts at J.P. Morgan. Assets under management in private equity, private debt, institutional real estate, and hedge funds grew 44% over the last five years. Public markets during the same period of time grew only 29%. Uh, that said, uh, this still dwarfed. The public markets are still vastly larger than the private markets. That does it for us. You can catch us each Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time, 6 p.m. in London and 2 p.m. in Hong Kong. The private markets getting bigger, still really small relative to public markets. From New York, this is Bloomberg Money Undercover.